friends, I'm Yvonne Stapp for Science for the Public, and I welcome you to Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. One of our most urgent global concerns is the need to switch from fossil fuels to green energy. Solar and wind are among the most familiar. A bit less familiar is hydrogen energy, and that is our topic today. One variation, blue hydrogen, is being promoted as an excellent source of green energy, but there are real concerns about that. So our guest today will explain the several forms of hydrogen energy and the special concerns about blue energy. Robert Howarth is the David R. Atkinson Professor of Ecology and Environmental Biology at Cornell University. He's also chair of the SCOPE International Biofuels Project. Last year, Dr. Howarth co-authored with Mark Jacobson at Stanford University a much cited article about the real carbon footprint of blue energy, or I'm sorry, blue hydrogen. The information in this article is a caution about certain innovations touted as green energy, and we're about to become a bit wiser. We are honored and delighted to welcome Dr. Robert Howarth. Thank you so much, sir, for joining us today. Thank you. It's great to be with you. And I would like to start, if you will, with a little bit of background about hydrogen energy in the first place, if you'd give us a kind of background there, and then we'd like to talk about that article. Absolutely. To begin with, hydrogen can be used as an energy source, but that's not primarily how it's been used uh, over the last hundred years. Hydrogen is made principally uh, for industrial purposes as a feedstock, yes. and it's also used to make fertilizer. It hasn't historically been used much as an energy source because it's, uh, it's relatively expensive to, to make, and yeah. it's also relatively difficult to handle. So if we look today at the, the hydrogen that's uh, in the world, uh, 95, 96% of all of the hydrogen that's been produced uh, is coming from fossil fuels. Uh, in the United States and Europe, natural gas is the feedstock for that, and the, the natural gas, the methane in natural gas, is converted in, into hydrogen. Uh, elsewhere in the world, in China, they use coal as a feedstock, but the hydrogen, basically it's an energy transformation. You're taking fossil fuels and you're making hydrogen out of it. And there are inherent inefficiencies with that, just part of the reason it's uh, expensive. It's also uh, part of the reason it, it has a high greenhouse gas footprint. Now there is a, uh, a truly green form of hydrogen and, and we call it green hydrogen. Uh, and that would be hydrogen that's made by electrolysis. Uh, so yeah. we use energy, electricity, and you electrolyze water into hydrogen and, and oxygen. And if that electricity is 100% green, if it's solar, wind, and hydro, then the hydrogen is, is also green. So we call that green hydrogen. The hydrogen that traditionally has been made from natural gas, we call gray hydrogen. That mm -hmm. that's made from brown, uh, from coal, we call brown hydrogen. So th those are the colors of hydrogen, if you will. The, the, the new player on the block is, is what industry has coined blue hydrogen, which is what our paper is about. And blue hydrogen is the gray hydrogen that's made from natural gas, but applying carbon capture to take some of the carbon dioxide emissions uh, and, and sequester them to, to, as, as an attempt to reduce the, the greenhouse gas footprint. And the, the, the concept for blue hydrogen, it, it's as a both as a term and as a concept, it's really less than half a dozen years old. And it, it, it's come out of the oil and gas industry uh, originally in Europe uh, four or five, six years ago. Uh, it's been heavily promoted largely by the, the big oil companies. There's a group called the Hydrogen Council that's been very, very big in, in promoting it. The Hydrogen Council is only set up in 2017. It's 100% the creation of British Petroleum, the French company Total, Shell Oil, and other big oil companies have joined in since. So blue hydrogen is this uh, thought that an industry has called it low emissions or near zero emissions. Uh, you know, quite frankly, I think it's a deliberate attempt to, to confuse with, with green hydrogen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. What our paper said, what our paper demonstrated is it's not green at all. Right, and that's where I wanna go next. Thank you very much because uh, that 
concept of hydrogen energy is not really that familiar yet. And it is a process that's rather complicated and dirty and expensive. And so the big issue is why is the fossil fuel industry so excited about this? So right. uh, as an alternative, in any case, uh, I want to talk about that article um, and uh, the facts that you laid out about the fossil footprint and so forth. Go ahead, please. Sure. I mean, I, I actually, uh, just a little bit of background, I'd never really heard of blue hydrogen, say two to three years no. ago. <laughs> it's a new concept. I hadn't heard of it. Uh, right. I first started hearing about it. I, I serve in, in New York on a group called the Climate Action Council, which is a commission set up by law to implement our aggressive climate legislation and try to drive our state to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions, say, by 40% over the next eight years and to a near carbon neutrality by 2050. So, you know, we're, we're charged with coming up with the details of how to implement that. And clearly, one of the things we need to do is to get fossil fuels and natural gas out of our heating systems, because that's the number one greenhouse yes. gas emission in the state of New York. And you know what our council has, has uh, put forward as a plan is, is beneficial electrification, use green electricity to power high efficiency heat pumps. That, that's the path forward for, for sure. But uh, industry was suggesting oh, a year or two ago that we instead consider the idea of using blue hydrogen and that this blue hydrogen could be put through the natural gas uh, infrastructure system, the pipelines. Turns out that's not true, but they were telling us that. And just as a replacement for natural gas, and they suggested this was a maybe a, a cheaper, easier way to decarbonize our, our, our heating needs. So I, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a scientist. I was skeptical when I first heard this, but I, I went and started uh, looking for the literature on what the greenhouse gas emissions associated with this uh, blue hydrogen might be. And it, it turns out that there really was virtually no uh, peer reviewed mm -hmm. literature on it. There are a bunch of reports, mostly produced by the industry. Yeah, they, yeah. they tended to just say things like it's low emissions or zero emissions mm -hmm. without presenting any data. So uh, I took it on as a, as a research challenge to try and, and look at the full life cycle emissions. And we looked at both carbon dioxide and, and methane. And the reason for methane is that uh, you know, natural gas is mostly methane. The methane in natural gas is the feedstock uh, that industry uses to make the hydrogen. And then they also use more natural gas to, to power this. So what they, the process is called steam methane reforming. You take the methane and natural gas, you put it under high pressure and temperature, you add a little steam and the methane decomposes into carbon dioxide and, and hydrogen. So, Part of the reason I'm, I'm stressing the methane is that when you develop and use uh, natural gas as a fuel, uh, some of that inevitably uh, is emitted to the atmosphere. And, and the best data suggests about uh, three or 4% of, of what's developed from a gas well ends up unburned in the atmosphere as opposed to being burned. Mm -hmm. Methane as a greenhouse gas is more than 100 times more powerful than carbon dioxide. So those, those methane emissions really matter. So when we go back to blue hydrogen, uh, even if industry were able to capture 100% of the carbon dioxide emissions that they have, they would still have large amounts of methane emissions because they're using the, the natural gas, again, both as that feedstock and as an energy source to drive it. Uh, as it turns out, uh, the carbon capture process isn't all that uh, great either. And I, I, I'm not an expert in that. So I brought in a co-author, Mark Jacobson from Stanford, who is an expert on that. And we looked at the best available data, but the, for the steam methane reforming process itself, there, there are really only two commercial plants that have ever tried this. Mm. Data are available from both of them. One's in Alberta, Canada, one's in Texas. Texas one was funded by the US Department of Energy, so the data are available to them. And for both of those two plants, they were capturing at best about 85% of the carbon dioxide mm -hmm. from that steam methane reforming. Sounds good, but 15% is still going up. And again, they're burning more natural gas in order to power that steam methane reforming. They didn't even try to capture that. And the best one can really do historically is maybe 65% of that combusted uh, carbon dioxide could be captured. If we look at real data over the last year, I just saw a new report this morning. Uh, there's only one plant in the world that's actually tried to capture carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion over the last year, 2021. And it was capturing well below 40%. So carbon capture is an overhyped uh, idea. It really yes. isn't all that effective. 
we used the best available data on how much carbon dioxide would really be captured and what the methane emissions were. And our conclusion is the greenhouse gas footprint of this blue hydrogen, it's not zero, it's not low, it's actually <laughs> greater than if you were to simply burn the natural gas. In fact, it's right. coal. It's about 20% worse than either one. So you're going through yes. a lot of effort, a lot of expense, it's, it's expensive stuff and it's high emitting. It's, it's, a, it's yeah. a terrible idea. Right, and that attracted a lot of attention and uh, toward hydrogen energy generally, the, the issues around hydrogen energy, but that 20% that greater than burning natural gas got quoted over and over and over again. And yeah. the real wake up call. And so thank you for all the work on that, but- yeah, Thank you. It's, it's actually, I, I should say it's a, you know, we, we knew our paper would, uh, be scrutinized carefully because the industry's worked very hard to promote oh, this yes. <laughs> And so we're well aware when we're writing it. And, and Mark and I are both, you know, experienced academics. We've, you know, I've published 200 papers or so and yes. you know, they've, they've gotten in sight. It's a, we know how to write. We were very, very careful. I and guess. Sure. Yes. There, there are really only four input assumptions into our whole analysis. One is how much methane is emitted. The second is the time frame over which you compare methane and yeah. carbon dioxide. Right. We used the best available science for that. We used all of the available science on the carbon dioxide capture efficiencies. If we weren't sure of something, we went on the uh, side of being uh, uh, conservative and, and giving the industry the benefit exactly. of the doubt. Exactly. But we also used a sensitivity test of our assumptions. So we said, well, what if, what if industry could cut those em methane emissions way, way down? And we used the lowest possible number that anyone ever thinks industry could really do. What if they could do super well capture with carbon dioxide? They never have, but let's, let's give them the benefit right. of the doubt and put them up as high as anyone's ever suggested they can. The conclusion is still, under any set of uh, assumptions we made, you'd be better off just burning natural gas than making this stuff. So it's a exactly. very, very robust conclusion. Right. Well, here's the thing that the fossil fuel industry, I hope people are aware of this, is a very powerful lobby. And, um, and I would say almost at an international level. Well, the fossil fuel industry was gung-ho on this, but your article was published, I believe, last August, and the responses are, are very favorable, I, I will add, in the media were, were out there sort of following that. And But in spite of that, a bill passed, I think, in the Senate, uh, for a $1 trillion infrastructure that would emphasize this hydrogen um, effort. And uh, President Biden spoke out for it and so on. I think that got watered down a wee bit in the House version, but this has been out there and you get the impression, if you read your article first, you get the impression that our representatives don't know much more about this stuff than we do in the general public. If you are not an expert, I, I'm not sure, but- I, I think that's a fair assessment. And, and you know, yeah. this, this isn't, it isn't rocket science, but let me be clear right. about that. Yeah. You know, it's, it's pretty straightforward science, but it's, it can be confusing. And if you haven't thought about it a lot before, it is confusing. Well, and, and, then, and it's the industry deliberately makes it confusing. Exactly. You know, the green hydrogen, it's, is probably a good thing. Again, that's the hydrogen from electrolysis. Uh, and I have some doubts about that, but it's probably a good thing. Calling blue hydrogen, it sounds the same. They say it's carbon free, it's not, but it all, you know, it all sounds like one. And if you're a busy person and you have other things on your plate, you go, oh, this is good because it allows us to wean ourselves of the natural gas and we can still keep the exactly. oil and gas industry happy and it's all wonderful. And it sounds good, the problem is it's wrong. <laughs> it's deadly wrong. That's, that's, that's right. Well, in, in any case, the, the, that lobby has a lot of influence, no question about it. And so the, the and people are busy and they, they wanna just get these bills through and they have the right impulse, but they can be very misinformed as can we all right now. But that is, that's a really big issue. And I'm glad that you were able to point this out, that there's a real problem here. And that includes the whole issue of don't worry about carbon capture, we can do it. That is proving over and over again, very difficult. But in any case, 
in, in your mind now, how viable is green hydrogen ag against the other types of green energy? Well, the, let, let's, you know, the green hydrogen is a, is a way of storing energy. It's not a new source yeah. of energy, right? So the energy is coming from wind, hydro, or solar in electricity, and then it's converted through the electrolysis of water into hydrogen. So it's a storage product, if you want to think of it that way. Okay. There's, there's energy loss when we, when we make that. So whenever you can use the electricity directly, we're probably better off. So the real, the real way to think about the green hydrogen is, is it a good way to store, you know, with, let's say we're, uh, it's a very windy day or a very bright sunny day and we're producing a surplus of uh, renewable electricity over our needs. Hydrogen is one way to store that until you can feed it back into the grid later. It's, it's not the only way to do so. So we should think carefully. We could use pump storage technologies. We can uh, store electricity by compressing air and feeding it back through generators liquefying air, uh, flywheel store electricity. There are a bunch of ways to store energy. Hydrogen's one of them. Uh, I'm not sure it's always the best one. And I think we should be more careful in, in ah. our analysis then, not just assume it's the best one, but yes. that's one use. Then there are other, other things which people talk about for using hydrogen for difficult to decarbonize aspects of our uh, energy economy. So things like long distance uh, transportation, uh, airplanes, yes. for instance, maybe ships. Uh, again, there, I'm not 100% convinced that that's true either, okay. but we should consider that. Uh, you know, my personal take at this point, if you'd asked me two years ago, I hadn't actually thought too much about hydrogen. It sounded right. reasonable. Uh, with the amount of effort we put into working on our blue hydrogen paper and looking in general at all of the ways people talk about using green hydrogen, I've become much more skeptical. So uh -huh. I think... There may be a, a role, but perhaps not what people thought. L let me give you an example. It's, uh, it's sometimes promoted for uh, local transportation or for cars or for trucks or even for buses, say. Uh, the market forces have clearly shown that the future of electric vehicles is with batteries, not hydrogen. Yeah. Toyota stood out as the last major manufacturer in the world saying, oh, we're going to try hydrogen and not just electric batteries. They finally gave up uh, last uh -huh. month. And, and, and they're no longer talking hydrogen. So we're not gonna have hydrogen cars, we simply aren't. And the reason for that is that uh, the electricity is easier to store in battery forms. It's, it's easier to uh, make the transformation. It's more efficient as well. For buses, people are still arguing about it. I just saw another report this morning, uh, the cost of, of uh, operating uh, and owning a bus that's powered by hydrogen is six times more than, than a bus ah. that's powered by electric batteries. And, and, and part of the reason for that is you're taking the electricity, you're making hydrogen, there's a loss of energy, you have to store it, that's difficult to do, it takes a lot of energy. And then on the buses, what they're doing is converting the hydrogen to a fuel cell back to electricity to power the bus, and there's inefficiencies this with that. Is, yes. So if you can use the electricity directly in a battery, it's far more efficient, it's easier, it's cheaper. So I think a lot of the things which people have assumed we're gonna need hydrogen for in the future, maybe it's been oversold in general. And that, that's for the good hydrogen. Okay, uh, thank you very much for that because that this is really important, but this is just another instance of a very expensive product basically and process uh, and seems to be a way to sustain the fossil fuel energy much more than to address the need for green energy. And so, I know that you have been most attentive to that. You attended the COP26 conference, I believe, correct? Yes, I and, did. Uh, I noted that the biggest uh, groups of people there uh, was the fossil fuel industry. <laughs> that uh -huh. were very they, much- they, they were obvious. <laughs> over your shoulders. They were there and you know, there were, there were exhibits talking about uh, natural gas as, as the best fuel for Yes. <laughs> development in the future saying, are you kidding me? And there's a lot right. of stuff promoting hydrogen. There's a lot of stuff promoting nuclear, which I also yes. don't think is a particularly yes. good idea. I just thought that was amazing that they would be the largest contingent inside the building, but the demonstrators were outside the building and considered. Yeah, this is my third God. third COP. I went to COP21 in, in, in Paris back in 2015 ah. when things really happened. And uh, I must say there's a lot more energy and social interaction there. This, this, uh, I mean, I think overall good things came out of this COP despite some of the criticisms, but uh, 
the the social forces were locked out of it basically yes and the, and the yeah, fossil well, and forces were that's very, right very prevalent that's right well that that's a, a concerning thing because you we're telling people get out there and make your voice heard and so on but that it's a lot harder to really influence uh, a, the, the governments and certainly the industries and the in, wherever the industry has such a voice. What was your general take on the COP26? A lot of us were really disappointed from outside here. Yeah, well, I guess uh, I wasn't disappointed, but that's probably because I went in with low expectations. <laughs> yes, right. And so it, it met my low expectations and exceeded them. There, there are two positive things out of it. Uh, you know, at COP21, the nations of the world all said we needed to keep the planet well below two degrees uh, Celsius from the pre-industrial baseline, recognizing 1.5 is a problem, and they came up with voluntary approaches for doing that. The voluntary approaches were never enough. At COP26, yeah. almost every nation in the world strengthened their voluntary uh, commitments over what they'd been in, in Paris. Uh, they still aren't enough but they're they're closer they're moving in the right direction so that that's good uh and you know i was surprised that the general talk of everyone at the meeting the the politicians the diplomats was no longer we need to keep it well below two degrees they were saying we really have to try for 1.5 when i was uh, in paris you know i and other scientists were saying we need to keep it below 1.5 and, and they just shrugged and said we can't so well below two so there's a recognition that the climate change is more of a problem than yes. there was in Paris, and they responded. So I think that's good. The other thing which I appreciated, you know, I've, I've worked on methane emissions for well, a long, long time. Yes. Uh, and you know, my research has, has demonstrated that uh, methane makes uh, natural gas a, a pretty lousy fuel, no bridge fuel at all. Uh, and you know, people at, at this COP universally were talking about methane in a way that I've never seen before. You know, I went to COP. Uh, 21 and COP24 in Bonn, and I gave a lot of presentations and media uh, interviews and things on, on, on the role of methane, and boy, it was pretty lonely, you know? <laughs> I felt like I was yeah. one of a handful of voices. There are 40,000 people in Paris. Yes. I might have been one of 10 people talking about methane. Wow. You know? Whereas at COP26, uh, everyone was talking about methane. President Biden showed up, and he spent a third of his public time talking about the methane and problem and the need to cut methane. So I, I'm delighted by that. Yes. Uh, in, in, in what Biden proposed still isn't enough for methane. You know, the World Meteorological Organization tells us that we can and should be cutting global methane emissions by 45% over the next eight years. Biden called for the world and the US to cut by 30%. It's not enough, we can do more, but still it's in the right direction. And it's the first acknowledgement by any, any global leader that we need to do anything with methane. So I was, I was really quite pleased by that. Well, that's a little cheerier. It's, a, it's just for some of us, it's more words. <laughs> you know, <that's> yeah. <laughs> a, and we need action. And unfortunately we need international action. This is a problem that is global. Right. And we have to move fast, and it seems like this is not something governments are particularly well designed to do. But uh, you know that they're not, and I, there's not a single national government that I'm aware of that's really doing enough. Maybe some of the Scandinavian countries. I'd be yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but we're one of the major producers, and we need. You know, if you look at Australia or United yes, Kingdom or, or exactly, also the Russia, big you know, it's not, it's not, not looking good. Right. I, on the other hand. Uh, uh, I've thought for a long time, at least in the United States, we need to be working through the states and, and not rely yes. on the federal government to do it. I thought that was true under President Obama. It was certainly true under President Trump. I think it's still true. And that gives me some optimism. I mean, here in New York, we do have this uh, Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act signed in 2019. It does call for reducing our greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030. Yes. The commission yes. I'm on has developed and released our, our implementation, our draft implementation plan last month. Uh, we, have a, we have the mechanisms to get there. I think the state is serious. I actually do believe we are going to meet those targets. And That's New York great. is, you know, we're one of the largest economies yeah. in the world. If you deconvolute the United States, we're on a par with a lot of European nations. So, you know, if we can demonstrate that we can do it in New York on that time scale, I think other countries and other states 
will right. pay attention and try to emulate it because not only can we do it, not only should we do it for ethical reasons, uh, it's good for the economy of New York State. Right, it's absolutely. Good for environmental justice, but it's good for the average person. And once people realize that, I think it's going to catch on. So I'm. It, it, uh, yes, there's just a whole new life around that. And we'll also save the planet and save health and a lot of other things. But in your mind, this is doable. I mean, we can use yeah. energy, we can deploy it. This, the forces are there now. And it seems as though the costs have been going down. And so what we're right. really up against is, in a sense, the fossil fuel resistance. Oh, that's, that's exactly right. I mean, if, if you look at uh, you know, where the emissions are coming from in New York, well, the, the number one source of emissions is heating and energy use in our buildings, our homes and commercial yes. buildings. And number two is transportation. And then number three is electricity. Well, you know, we're on, we're on a, a, a pathway to decarbonizing electricity in, in New York yes. State very aggressively. I have no right. doubt we're going to meet that. Great. Uh, the uh, transportation sector, actually market forces are going to move us there. You'd be crazy not to buy an electric car in five years and, and the manufacturers are going to stop making internal combustion engines. So that's moving mm -hmm. in the right direction. The biggest thing in New York is our, our heating of our buildings. Mm -hmm. And it, what our commission has proposed and the governor has actually endorsed, she gave her state of the state speech last week and endorsed this, is prohibiting the use of, of fossil fuels in new uh, construction. Yes, pr saw pretty that. Soon. And it's, you know, that's cost effective. We, we did the analysis as way of background. The governor is convinced by that. It's not only good energy policy, it's good economics. The only reason people continue to use fossil fuels in new homes is that they're subsidized by the gas utility mm -hmm. and they just don't think about it. They'd be mm -hmm. better off not doing that. You know, then we still are, are stuck. We've got six million individual family homes uh, that are heated with fossil fuels in New York State, and an equal number of apartments that are heated with fossil fuels. And we need to decarbonize those. But you know, the clearly we, what we want to do is retrofit those with with right. heat pumps, and I think probably ground source heat pumps more than yes, yeah, pumps. yeah, another. Uh, and you know that's it's a big capital cost up front, but the economics make sense. Just, I, I, I exactly. did it in my own house. I own an 1890s farmhouse. I used to heat with oil. Back in 2014, we decided to put in a ground source heat pump and get rid of the oil tank and, and furnace. Uh, I haven't quite paid that capital cost off yes. yet, uh, seven or eight years later, but I will within the next year or two. Uh, right. So it's affordable. So that the 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 issue is, you know, how do we? Uh, when we do this at scale, the economics are going to become more favorable, and we're, we're thinking maybe we should do it neighborhood by neighborhood and have you know ground loops of, of the cooling material that you extract your heat from. So each home has a heat pump, but the rather than a, a field for extracting the heat for each home, we do that at the neighborhood scale, and there are probably economies of scale with that. Uh, what we need to do is come up with a funding mechanism to make that affordable upfront to the homeowner to retrofit, and then they can pay it back over time. Because over 20 years, it makes economic sense to anyone to do it. It's just a right. big upfront capital cost. Although it's not right. huge, it's, it's the cost of remodeling your bathroom on average. Right. Well, the thing, which people yes, do. Your, your, the, the real point there is it is doable. It, the, it is doable. The, the technology and the the sources are available. It's a question of getting them out there. But your neighborhood sort of approach suggestion there is interesting because that also helps people to understand and become committed to this and to understand the value economically down the line and environmentally as well. Yeah that you you can really get through to people so and it may be a way of getting past this wall that is imposed by the fossil fuel <laughs> industry well you know w w one mechanism and then you know it's, we still have a year to debate this with public hearings and all before the yeah. commission come up with the final plan but but the mechanism I, I favor and i think makes sense although there are others is to have the utilities be the people who provide these uh, yes. this, this uh, neighborhood make the shift. Uh, food exchange, right? And, yes. and, and they can raise the capital to do it and then charge a, a source back over time. It's, it's a similar business model to what they've been doing historically selling natural gas or electricity, only yes. we move them into the 21st century. It moves them into and the, yeah. Get them <laughs> to do that. At least the 20th so, century. <laughs> and they're going to come down, you know, they're going to come down your street. They're going to lay it out. They're going to explain that, by the way, yes. if your gas furnace dies in 10 years, it's going to be illegal in New York to replace it. That's good. True. Yes. But now is a good time to get rid of it. Here it is. Connect like all of your neighbors are doing. 
Exactly. And I actually, I think that can work. I think it will work. And the governor's, you know, in her state of the state speech again, committed to uh, retrofitting 2 million New York homes within the next eight years. That's the sort of target we need. You know, that's, that's more or less what our commission has laid out. We've got right. 6 million homes altogether. So that's a, that's a third You'll of the way there. Uh, and once it gets going, it's only going to accelerate. I'm right, sure I'm convinced of right, that. right, right. So I just want to underscore again that the means are there and it can be as doable and we could avoid this whole thing about the merits of blue energy and all right. the rest of it. We <laughs> see a lot of uh, stuff, I hate to say silly stuff, but about carbon capture and so on, it becomes almost fantastic, you know, that. <laughs> well, but, the carbon capture, it's it just, it's never worked. People say, no. well, in the future it might work. I don't know, maybe it will, maybe it won't. I doubt it. But the thing, the yeah. laws of chemistry and physics tell us it's difficult. And my right. colleague, very, Mark Jacobson, very, again, very. But he's very outspoken. Case, it's, it's greenwashing. And I agree with him. It's greenwashing. It is. It, it is. But thank you for, for that. And I hope that uh, I want to point out before I shift to something else here that your article, the actual article is actually readable. A lot of these articles are very technical and in something like uh, the hydrogen is technical anyway, but I thought, gosh, this was accessible. But then Cornell University wrote a synopsis about this that is also very, very good. That's all on the event page that, uh, for you today. And I hope that people will read this kind of material because it's important for all of us to know it. Before yeah. we close, Dr. Howarth, uh, you've done a number of things uh, in your field, made a number of contributions. And I would like to point out to people that you are signed on as a biogeochemist. <laughs> so <That's right. laughs> I, this is the direction of the future, these inter integrated fields instead of these uh, very narrow spe uh, specializations. And you've worked a great deal on ecosystems. Can you tell us what kinds of things you've worked on that you've really felt best about? Sure. Yeah, no, thank, thank you for that. Uh, and I am indeed a biogeochemist. And, you know, <laughs> not a term we use too much in the public. People, if you say that, people go, oh, you're a biochemist. No, I'm not a biochemist. I'm a biogeochemist. <laughs> right. you know, biogeochemistry is the studying the chemistry of, of large systems, the earth as a whole or whole ecosystems and, and how environmental chemistry interacts with life at a variety of scales. That, that's what we do from local to, to global. And so, you know, in, in my own career, I've spent a lot of time looking at uh, coastal nutrient pollution, yes. what causes the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, the water quality problems in Long Island Sound, the Baltic Sea, et cetera. And, you know, there, there used to be a scientific debate about which nutrient was more important, nitrogen versus phosphorus. In lakes, it's phosphorus. In coastal oceans, it's usually nitrogen. And, and I, much of my research career was documenting the difference and the mechanisms behind that and, and proving that difference. I'm, I'm quite pleased with that work. We've also done a lot of work uh, over decades working with a large number of people tracking where nutrient pollution comes from and the relative roles of suburban sprawl versus yes. Uh, yes. Uh, agriculture and some of the detailed practices of, of that. Uh, and I, I led for quite a while a, a group of the International Council of Science for about 10 years actually, looking globally at, at how that works out. And I, you know, I think uh, it, it was a team effort. There are hundreds of people involved, but I was one of the co-leaders. And you know, we, we transformed how the scientific community looks at and thinks about nutrient pollution, which, which I'm I'm quite proud of. And then the yeah. one of the leaps I made was uh, when the shale gas revolution started back in 2008 or 9, 2010, uh, and it's being promoted as a, as a bridge fuel. This is getting natural gas out of shale from high volume hydraulic fracturing. Uh, you know, I, I started uh, worrying about the methane emissions aspect yes. of that, and, and no one was working on methane emissions from there. Uh, and so I and, and colleagues, Tony and Graffi, who's an engineer at, at Cornell, uh, took it on. We challenged, we, we wrote the first ever paper on the extent of methane emissions from developing and using shale gas and, and concluded, based on very, very preliminary data, that it was probably no bridge fuel at all. It was probably a climate disaster. Well, you know, our paper was published in 2011, in the spring of 2011. <laughs> Got enough publicity that Tony and I were two of the runners up for uh, of the 50 people for uh, person of the year in Time Magazine back in 2011. Yay. <laughs> uh, but what I'm more proud of than that 
is that we spark uh, community interest among scientists. So as of today, there are about 1,700 peer-reviewed papers published in that topic. Ours was the first, right? <laughs> yes. And initially, a lot of people said, oh, you can't be right. It's got to be like this, that, or whatever. The yeah. science, and I didn't know, you know, who knows? Science, uh, you're often wrong as a scientist, although I thought we were right. Uh, but the, the science has worked in our favor. And, you know, the vast preponderance of the information out there now, 85, 90% of these 1,700 plus papers say that what we did initially was right. pretty damn close to the truth. So I'm... I'm proud of that. And that's an example. Hey, people go, well, that's engineering. What, what are you doing? You're an ecologist. Well, again, I'm yeah. a biogeochemist. And you know, we're used right. to looking at things like the global methane cycle. And, and part of what informed our analysis was the other sources and sinks from natural ecosystems and how it balanced it out. So you know, an engineer might just look at the engineering side of it. But as a biogeochemist, we have a, a different, broader, sort of uh, multidisciplinary approach, which I, you know, I, I would... I'm just delighted I chose this for my professional field well, uh, that, plus yeah. years ago because it gives you so much flexibility to do things which are intellectually stimulating. You know, you're you really are gaining, developing new information, and it matters. And being able to do both of those matter. things is just so. You know, I'm, I'm so uh, delighted that that I've been able to do that. It's a great right. Field. I just have to tack on there about the shale a thing that where you were a real pioneer on that because when that first came out, that was touted as this is going to be wonderful. It's cheap, and we're going to just produce all this gas and stuff. Right. And when it it took a while, but I remember the the the, the federal support for this sort of thing, and then it proved over and over again, we're having health problems, we're ruining the environment, it is, and, and the atmosphere, it, right. it, it just was a disaster, and so thank you for getting out there and taking that risk, because sometimes academics or scientists get slapped in the face <laughs> they're not well, <laughs> we got some pushback but <laughs> <laughs> That's you know, uh, there was pushback <laughs> i'm, I'm was, glad we did it there were some days yeah. back in 2012 i wasn't sure <laughs> exactly <laughs> but i remember later, exactly really at that it. time there was a lot of interest in shale oh yeah proved to be a disaster and it's it continues it's and it's disaster for a lot of well, reasons our, our methane story is just part of it but it's uh, and a lot of very talented scientists and and uh activists you know push push back hard so i'm, I'm right I'm, and I'm now you're pushing back against that, blue hydrogen so. <laughs> well you know it, it felt familiar and we sort of expected the pushback because i, I yeah I know how right it <laughs> no but uh, these are these are media articles i've put on that list but i was surprised at how people picked up on this the uh the the media uh that they were they quoted over and over again from that article. So I, maybe we're making headway. Well, we here. got we got nice coverage, and I, you know, I talked to a lot yeah. of reporters uh, as it came out, but also before it came out, which is partly what you're seeing. And and they found our arguments convincing. In part, yes. is, we we did try to make the paper approachable, readable, and yes, you know, and it did. Press is it not is. used to that, so they right, no right. Used to it. Uh, right. I think that helped. And you know, for those who wanted to look back. Uh, through my history, uh, I mean, several of them told me this, boy, you, you did this uh, important novel work on shale gas and methane way back in 2011, and you got you got just trounced, and there's all this, you know, newspaper yes. accounts of that, yes. but yeah. turns out you're right, and everyone thinks you're, you're right. right now. And you got the last laugh. I think that gave me some credibility going into this. Yes. That's partly what you're yes. saying. Yes. Well, I hope it gets a Nobel too. It wouldn't hurt. <laughs> well, I just hope it makes a I, difference. You know? I want to come back to you another time on that, uh, uh, especially some of your uh, ecosystem work as well. But uh, you covered a lot of ground. I hope it's an inspiration to young people looking into this field broadly of what you need to prepare with and, and what you can accomplish because it yeah. seems extremely rich. Uh, I need to leave it there. And I thank you ever so much for being with us today. Uh, it's been delightful to talk with you and best of luck with this. Thank Save you. the planet. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. It's been, been great chatting with you. Take care.